In 1993, a group of Wolf Team staff members set out to establish a company by the name of Neferland. In their final days, they were known for their quirky farming simulators, but at their genesis was a franchise that would peak with the second entry before slowly fading into an unfortunate loss of identity. The studio's first projects were two RPGs planned for the PC-98 family of computers, Felrose and Estil. Not much is known about the former, but the latter became Biography of Estpolis, or Lufia as it's known in the West. The exact details of this transition aren't known, although unverified bits of info claim it was originally going to be on the NES, and that the project was split into the two SNES games. There's also an advertisement from Taito USA that mentions the first game would get ported to the Mega Drive, although people theorize that this was cancelled to focus production on the second game, or that it was targeted at the American market and got dropped when Taito USA went tits up. Rufia as we know it is a series of Japanese role-playing games connected through the story of its titular heroine. The first entry, Rufia and the Fortress of Doom, was released in 1993, and it's most definitely one of the JRPGs ever. It's the quintessential example of the genre, and it lays itself bare right from the start and doesn't try to surprise you too much. The gameplay is decent, the graphics are decent, the story is decent, and the soundtrack is pretty good. It's a game that's boring to talk about, but it's the good kind of boring, and retroactively becomes more interesting once you play the second game. We'll get to that later. Rufia 1 begins with Maxim and his party in fighting themselves into the Fortress of Doom, where the four Sinistros await their impending beatdown. After their defeat, the Sinistros pull one last trick and attack the party with their spiritual force. Maxim and his companions counter with their own, overwhelming the Sinistros and stopping their reign of terror. However, the strain was too strong for Selen to handle, leaving her knocking on Heaven's door. Artie and Guy manage to escape with magic, but Maxim and Selen are trapped and fall to their doom together with the fortress, leaving only the hope that their child can live in an age of peace. Ninety years have passed and the Battle of Doom Island faded into history. One day, the nameless hero, descendant of Maxim and an orphan living at an inn in the kingdom of Alekia, meets a mysterious girl called Rufia. The two quickly become friends and another nine years go by without a hassle. The hero has been training to become a knight, but yet again training is cancelled because nobody showed up. The peaceful times have made people grow complacent, and he finds himself estranged by everyone taking it for granted. Back home, Rufia happily decides to bake a cinnamon pie for him, and that's when he hears gossip that the nearby kingdom of Sharon was attacked by monsters, something that hasn't happened in a very long time. Much to Rufius' chagrin, the hero quickly heads out to investigate it himself, and discovers that indeed Sharon has been attacked. But nobody in Alekia seems to care, and Rufia is still mad about the pie, so nothing you can do here besides leave. Of course, she's not really mad about the pie, she's just worried about you going off on a dangerous adventure by yourself. So after a minute of bickering, Rufia forces herself into the party and with that your journey begins. First step would be to find out what happened in Sharon, and surprise, one of the Sinistros shows up and smacks you in the head. Monsters are showing up all over the world again, and the big evils have come back to wreck humanity. 
Only you, descendant of Maxim, can wield the plot sword and put an end to the reign of terror. Rufia One's story starts and ends quite strong, but everything in the middle isn't terribly interesting, with some story beats that you can see coming from a mile away and a journey that takes you through the entire land through menial tasks like cooking. It's a world filled with bog-standard fantasy tropes. Humans and elves, bats and goblins, dragons and demons. But it is still an important title to talk about, since it laid the foundations for the sequels. Between the threat of world destruction, the series is laced with interpersonal drama. This game might not have the strongest dialogue, but the interactions between the hero and Rufia are charming to watch. The game makes it fairly clear that both understand and trust each other, yet are too squeamish to openly admit their feelings for one another. They quarrel over the dumbest stuff, and those corny moments mark their relationship, which is used to great effect when the script pulls the rug on the player. The other two party members aren't as developed, and aside from a few gags, don't have that much presence. Aguro and Cherin are mostly there so you can fill a four-member party while the two leads remain in the spotlight. But it does pick up near the end, when it throws at you the iconic twist that the next two games repurposed in different ways. And the ending itself is quite impactful, despite the flaccid final boss that doesn't even have a unique battle theme. As for the gameplay, there aren't many surprises. You have NPCs to talk to, dungeons to explore, and towns that bring out my inner kleptomaniac. Hey, I'm not a thief, I'm a treasure hunter. The game's progression is very linear, with the next area usually being blocked for one reason or another until you clear the necessary story events. Dungeons are pretty straightforward, and the amount of puzzles relying on more than flicking a switch can be counted on one finger. Your main obstacle is the random encounters, which are frequent and dangerous due to enemies hitting like a truck full of explosives. It's your standard turn-based system where each participant takes turns at hitting each other, and at your disposal is basic attacks, items and magic. There are no advanced mechanics like the IP system found in the sequel, and your four party members have clearly designated roles. The hero is an all-rounder that can deal good damage with physical attacks and is decently competent with healing and support magic. Rufia carries min-maxed intelligence and a repertoire of powerful spells. She's capable of exploding an entire continent, but incapable of swatting a mosquito. Aguro is all about physical damage, with high HP, attack and defense, but zero utility since he can't use magic. And finally, Jerin has a variety of utility spells that can buff the party or cripple enemies, and her bows let her attack an entire group of enemies. The only thing of note is the old school quirks, such as how attacks against dead enemies don't get redirected, and how you can't specifically target individual enemies within a group. The target is simply chosen at random. Presumably, the agility and weight stats influence the order in which characters take turns, but at least due to the way it's presented, it never feels like there's a logical order that you can plan your characters' turns around. Besides that, there's not much else to say about the mechanics. It's a numbers game. It doesn't require or even incentivize careful planning and strategizing. Attack when you're safe, heal when you're in danger, and you'll be fine. Probably. Aguro is the weakest link here, with his physical stats being maybe 10% higher than the heroes. Dealing an extra 20 or 30 points of damage doesn't make up for his total lack of anything besides basic attacks. 
chances are you end up doing a bit of grinding to even the odds, unless you already know where to look for some useful items, like desecrating a corpse. But the game is happy to let you visit the next town and spend your gold shillings on stronger equipment before you're supposed to. Even more so after you get the boat and are free to go anywhere. Healing spells are also plentiful and items are cheap, so it all balances out in the end. As a whole, the gameplay is inoffensive at best and frustrating at worst. There's only two points where the flaws really start nagging. One is a boss battle that effectively functions as a numbers check combined with healing spam, and the other is a lengthy section halfway through the story where you have to backtrack several dungeons and climb three towers full of extremely powerful enemies that will smash your face unless you grind for a bit. I'm sure that most people who gave up on this game did it here. Also, I think something was lost in translation, because that discussion about rubies and sapphires sounds like total nonsense. Overall, it's fine. It's competently made, but not something I'd put on a best of list. Its most distinguishable aspect is where it sits in the context of the series, and we'll dive into that in a hot minute. But the gist of it is that the second game is actually a prequel that tells the story of Maxim's party. Which means that I just spoiled its ending. Oops. Released in 1995, Rufia 2 isn't satisfied with being more of the same. Instead, it mixes a number of different systems together to create something truly special that stands together with the best of the golden era of JRPGs. The story starts in the village of El Cid, as Maxim comes back from his day job of killing the weakest monsters in the game. Naturally, his childhood friend and shop owner Tia isn't going to pay him more than scraps, instead suggesting that he settle down with her at the store. After displaying a total lack of delicacy and going out with Gramps for a tutorial, a villager comes running saying that the passage to the nearby village was closed by monsters and they stole the key, so someone has to go get it back. Once you've beaten the shiz out of a wizard, Maxim is left wondering how did a monster like that have the brain cells to steal the key, and what would they gain from doing that? Enter Iris, a woman who claims to see the future and that he's destined for great things. She says that the strange ball of light that was seen flying through the sky is the reason for all this, and that left unchecked will eventually grow to swallow the entire world in evil. But Maxim and a select few others have the power to fight back against this evil. So Maxim sets out on a journey, not only to find these other people that can stand up to the Sinistros, but also to discover what his destiny is. While the first game had a fixed party, Rufia 2 instead has several different characters that will come and go as the story progresses, and a good chunk of the dialogue continues to be allocated to their interactions. None of it is groundbreaking or particularly original, but the way it's written and executed props it up to a higher level, with the various party members playing off each other very well. Stuff like Guy the Bruiser Chokester who frequently gets lambasted by his girlfriend, butting heads with Dekar, a doofus with zero functioning brain cells who crushes the enemy's plans in the dumbest ways. There's also moments like the origin story of the Prefia flowers that Lufia loved so much, or how Vexis, the mad scientist, realizes that his inventions are hurting the environment, and promises to prove his genius by making better machines and spreading flowers throughout the world. There's also a lot to say about Maxim and Selen's marriage, as well as the events leading up to it. 
Sewen is the strongest fighter in the kingdom of Parsevite, stubborn and standoffish at first, but melting over the course of a few hours as she begins to understand her limits and relying on her companions for help. On one hand, the marriage is appropriately silly, with it getting interrupted by monsters and the pair throwing their fancy suits away to go smack them off screen. It's then followed by a wholesome montage of the two living happily for a year, raising their kid as the seasons go by. On the other hand, you have Tia. She's clumsy and keeps getting in trouble, but she's a good girl with a meaningful name. Her name sounds like Tear, so because she was a crybaby, other kids mocked her. But thanks to Maxim, she grew emotionally strong and promised herself that she would never cry again unless it was for the man she loves. That's foreshadowing, yes. She remains in the party for the first half of the story, continuously building up her attraction to Maxim and doing everything in her power to make him wake up and realize how she feels. And this is where the developers decided to be extra cruel. One thing this game does very well is to make you feel something despite already knowing the conclusion. If you know anything about Lufia 1, you already know who is going to win the Maxim Olympics, yet you can't do anything to stop the tears from flowing. Tia has grown up with him, subtly inciting him to settle down, and then the voice of fate knocks on the door, tells Maxim to go away, and he ends up getting cozy with some lady from another country. Oof. This is probably the most contested part of the story. Some argue that this scene could have been handled better, or that the romance could have been more developed. Some fans also dislike how Maxim kind of acts like an asshole here, since he is hyper-focused on fate and barely gives Tia the time of day after he meets Seven. This game also introduces Eric the Absolute who is said to be the king of the Sinistros, but never actually does anything. He's just this nebulous entity that sends Erim, one of the Sinistros, off on a mission to ascertain the rules of nature and whether it is humans or Sinistros that are meant to survive. For spoilery reasons, she's easily one of the most interesting characters in the series, though ironically the rest of the Sinistros are probably the weakest part of the lore. Despite being called Rise of the Sinistros, the game doesn't really explain how or why the Sinistros came to be. The closest it gets is when the villagers of Narfik explain that they are bad super beings. Love that classic Nintendo censorship leading to new and exciting ways of referring to gods. The Japanese script refers to them as the Four Mad Gods, so the quick and dirty is that they are deities of some sort that became corrupted and evil. But before I get into through spoiler territory, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. If you played Lufia 1, you know already how Maxim's journey ends. Poorly. The thing is, without the proper context, that intro doesn't really mean much. Having that part be fully playable is very cool, and late in the game when you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with those same enemies, it shows just how far you've come. You have grown as powerful as the legendary heroes. But the player doesn't have any emotional attachment to them as characters. Fortress of Doom never expands on Maxim's quest or his companions to any meaningful degree. They are just the backstory. It's an unusual situation, where you need to play the sequel in order to fully appreciate it. Because then you know what the characters went through. The good times, the bad times, the English version had no quality assurance times, and perhaps that is the greatest victory of Lufia 2's story. 
It's about the journey, not the destination. You already know the twist, but that bag of bricks is still gonna hit you. Plus, there's an extra section where Doom Island is on a collision course to Parsevite, but Maxim manages to redirect it to the sea next to the continent where the first game takes place. Anyway, I will be entering big spoiler territory now. If you want to remain unspoiled, skip to the timestamp on screen. The overarching link between the Lufia games is the commonality of two people coming to know each other and of their inevitable separation, almost like a cycle that repeats every hundred years. This cycle is linked to Iris, whose true identity is Erim, the Sinistral of Death. She has the most important power of all. As long as she's alive, then the other three Sinistrals will eventually come back to life. The only way to end the Sinistrals for good is to somehow kill Erim permanently. Or, from Maxim's point of view, kill Iris, someone who helps and guides him at multiple points, despite her role being intended to be one of observing and nothing more. For all intents and purposes, she's an ally, and a force for good. In fact, Maxim was supposed to have died on his battle with Gaddis, but Iris herself saves the party from certain doom. As a result, Maxim established a bloodline of red-haired boys that get mingled up with the Sinistrals in some way. Iris's tale is that of an evil entity who grows attached to mortals after spending time with them. However, she's a Sinistral and Maxim is a human, so by nature they are enemies. But what if things were different? And that's where Lufia comes in. The big reveal is that she is the second incarnation of Erim, who lost her memory and magic powers after falling with the fortress down into the sea after the first conflict. The developers get big points for the clever connection between story and gameplay here. The more Lufia grows in level, the more she regains Erim's powerful magic. But ultimately, she is a Sinistral, and that means the hero has to kill his loved one to put an end to mankind's suffering. Late in the story, the party goes on a journey to find the Dual Blade, Maxim's legendary weapon, a sword that amplifies the wielder's spiritual force. It was a beacon of hope that would save the day, yet it acts on its own and cuts down Lufia, because its purpose is to kill the Sinistrals. Her death even parallels the end of Maxim's journey, with the hero's spiritual force going bonkers and pushing everyone back. And it's grim. The hero becomes almost a husk of himself, slowly walking away from his two surviving friends after watching her fall to her doom. As she admits in her final moments, she was happier during her short life as Lufia than the eternity she spent as Erim. It's a powerful scene that comes as a surprise from a game that is otherwise incredibly average. Of course, this being the very first game means that the devs were still figuring things out, so the game as pulls its way out with Lufia reappearing at the end, but once again having lost her memory and powers. And if the series had ended with the second game, then yes, it could have been a bittersweet ending. But the Legend Returns exists and the Sinistrals came back, which means that another of Maxim's descendants will have to raise the Dual Blade against his loved ones once more. So, let's talk gameplay. The JRPG core remains, but it has a bunch of cool mechanics that makes it vastly more engaging to play than its predecessor. 
The fundamentals were updated, with enemies not being separated into groups anymore, and now you can choose exactly which targets to cast spells on, with the effect then being divided between them. This includes damage spells, healing spells, and even stat buffs, meaning that you can do things like focus an attack boosting spell on your physical attackers. Magic is no longer learned through level ups, however. Instead, it's bought for each character using hard cash. This can be mildly annoying late game, when RT joins the party and you have to go on a trip to buy him everything gold. But you do get tons of gold, so grinding is never an issue. The dungeons got a big step up in the form of actual puzzles, ranging from simple object movement to logic challenges that make me feel really stupid sometimes. There's a lot of variety and creativity on display here, with many that require you to figure out patterns or to think outside the box. These are complemented by the introduction of tools that allow the player to maneuver the environment. You have arrows and fire arrows to hit distant stuff and set plants on fire, bombs to blow stuff up, a hook to move over pits, and a hammer that can destroy stuff from a distance. Dungeons also no longer have random encounters, instead enemies move around the map, and touching them initiates a battle. If you touch them from the side or the back, you get rewarded with a preemptive attack. Dealing with enemies is basically a puzzle on its own. Every step you take, enemies also take a step. But they all have different movement patterns that can be manipulated to your advantage, by moving into proper position or by paralyzing them for a few steps by hitting them with a tool. Combat got a shakeup as well, with the introduction of the IP gauge. It charges when a character takes damage, and can be expended to unleash all kinds of special abilities, both offensive and defensive. These IP skills are linked to individual pieces of equipment, turning the process of choosing equipment into more than a simple numbers game. Seriously, you can cripple bosses so hard with some of these, it's amazing. Just because an item gives you the biggest PP doesn't mean it's the optimal choice in all situations. For example, take the Insect Crush, an early game weapon that deals extra damage to insects and comes with a skill that hits all enemies. It doesn't take long until its basic stats get surpassed, but there's plenty of insect enemies in the next few areas, and hitting all enemies is always useful. The party size has also been expanded to 5, or 4.5 I guess, with the new Capsule Monsters. Capsule Monsters... Oh, it all comes together now. Hidden throughout the world are seven capsule monsters, each aligned with a different element and with five different forms, each with its own set of abilities. They are very fragile, and their actions seem to be totally random, but they always revive after every battle, and can inflict vast amounts of damage with certain forms. While they do increase in levels by earning experience points, the main way to power them up is to feed them equipment, letting them evolve into the next evolution stage. But those picky bastards won't take just any equipment. The stronger they are, the higher the quality they demand, which means buying more expensive items or alternatively feeding them the rare stuff you already have but no longer need. That's a clever way to clean up your inventory, which is pretty large but not infinite. Taken as a whole, Rufia 2 is a well-paced play, with more than enough gold and experience awarded just for fighting enemies you naturally encounter on your way. 
it's definitely on the easy side, especially late game where it becomes a total cakewalk. But it also has enough depth to reward players that take the time to pick the right equipment and skills. The downside of these mechanics is that the party starts feeling a bit homogenous by the end, since everyone can do a bit of everything. Even Guy and Dekar, who can't use magic, have tons of equipment that substitutes for it. Though, unlike Agro, they actually have a large stat advantage over Maxim. There's very little restrictions regarding who can learn what magic too, with just Maxim not being able to learn fire spells, and Artie being the only one that can learn light spells. All two of them. There's also one glaring flaw with the structure of the story that makes it somewhat repetitive and predictable. The world is divided into chunks with one or two towns and dungeons, and the gate taking you to the next zone is always inaccessible until you complete the required story bits. Similarly, a majority of dungeons require you to find a key before you can access the final room, which curiously is also always located at the top. I don't think it's a big deal, but when you stop to ponder about it, it does make the world feel a bit artificial. On a more positive note, I have to mention The Ancient Cave, a completely optional piece of content that is so good it was made into its own mobile game back in 2003 and has appeared in some form in every game since. This dungeon resets your party to level 1, strips them of their equipment and magic, and throws them into a hundred floors of randomly generated action. Every floor has various enemies and treasure chests that contain all kinds of items picked at random, and whatever you get is what you're stuck with. The exception is blue chests, which contain very powerful equipment that you can carry between runs. The goal is to reach the last floor, which is glitched in the English version because of course, and to collect all of the iris treasures. These don't do anything practical, but at least they look pretty. Sure, the algorithm is primitive, and it won't take long until it exhausts its available building blocks. But the combat mechanics keep it all together. When you have to make do with what you get, you really start to appreciate every piece of equipment. And the developers knew it was awesome, because beating the game twice unlocks Gift Mode, which takes you straight to the Ancient Cave and lets you pick any combination of party members to go with you. Yes, that includes Tia, who is gone long before the Ancient Cave is accessible. Before ending the video, I'd just like to elaborate on the issues with the English releases. Rufia 1 occasionally has some awkward grammar as well as some minor censorship, but it's pretty alright given the standards back then. The only big omission is that item descriptions were removed. Rufia 2 is a different story. It's riddled with bugs, a handful that can ruin your save file, and a bunch that are harmless but still so obvious they shouldn't have passed quality control, assuming there was any. The glitchy maps are always fun when it happens on a critical story moment, but there's also random things like broken location names, certain enemies with malfunctioning AI, and a bug on the equipment screen that doesn't properly clear the text when you shift between characters. The dialogue itself also has its share of unintentional hilarity, like an elf using the word Chigundo, or the brain boy of the Sinistrals calling the party a bunch of hoochies. 
thankfully we are in the current year and patches have been created by dedicated fans to remedy these issues. So experiencing the classics has never been better. And if you're wondering why I'm not covering Curse of the Sinistrals in this video, it's because that game is a whole different can of worms. Is Wufia 2 as much of a masterpiece as I claim it to be? Maybe not. But then again, nothing really is. It's just that the game hits such a consistently high standard that when it does fumble on something, it sticks out more, whereas 95% of Wufia 1 is a flat line sitting in the middle of the chart. It's competently crafted, but it isn't a game that you'll be missing out on by not playing. But Wufia 2 is very much worth playing. It's a game that stands the test of time, with a gripping story, a kick-ass soundtrack, and a buttload of engaging systems. It's one of the reasons why I became such an avid lover of JRPGs, and it has stuck with me for decades.